morning. My sermon title is Obviously Difficult. So now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. I don't like to admit that this happens to me more frequently than it once did, but deep down, I know it's true. I'm intent on a project, and in the process discover I'm missing a tool or some piece of information located in another part of the house. So I head in the direction of the room containing the needed article, and then, and then the telephone rings, or maybe the buzzer on the dryer goes off, or, or maybe I just manage to get distracted by nothing of outside stimuli at all. It doesn't take much for me to arrive at my destination, stand there, and wonder what on earth it was that brought me to that room. Sometimes the fog will lift, but that doesn't always work. More often than not, I need to walk out of the room, retrace my steps, go back to the room that I came from, and start over. That way, I can establish context and remember the bigger picture of what it was I was doing so I can return with greater awareness of what I needed. I thought of this all too frequent scenario when thinking about this morning's gospel text. Not to highlight the sorry state of my memory, but rather about having context. It's critical. Critical for our comprehension and critical for our understanding next steps. When it comes to our gospel readings, why they don't get much shorter than today's. It's just five short verses. What's more, the key phrase in it, Jesus' new commandment, contains three words. Love one another. Just as Jesus has loved us. Love one another. Now maybe you're thinking what I first thought when I sat down to write this sermon. Really? Could there be a more basic more obvious instruction to preach on than that? What am I going to say? I highly doubt it's a news flash for anybody here. And you may be thinking, well, duh. Am I missing something? Of course, love one another. Well, as a matter of fact, perhaps you are. At least I was when I first started to investigate the text because there are deeper insights to be gained when we do a little literary retracing of our steps. To go back, to hear the words again, but this time in light of the passages that surround it. In other words, we need to establish context in order to discover greater meaning. The Gospel of John is often described as having two major sections. Part one spans the first 12 chapters. It's called the Book of Signs, where Jesus reveals miracles and teachings and has a variety of encounters. And then with chapter 13, the Book of Glory begins. And here Jesus' ultimate meaning comes into view through a lengthy discourse and parting remarks to his disciples, through the arrest, <coughs> trial, crucifixion, and rising. Chapter 13 starts with John's version of the Last Supper. And knowing that his hour to depart was near, Jesus has some thoughts he wants to leave his followers with. I think it's really noteworthy that he doesn't begin with, say, go start a revolution or, or be a martyr and die for the cause. No, instead, he begins by washing the feet of his disciples and says, go and do likewise. And then as we just read in verse 34, Jesus commands them to love one another. Gentle, humble comments. So like us, the disciples think they understand. They're equipped to follow Jesus' instructions. 
but a closer inspection suggests they're not as prepared as they think they are, because context here is everything. Because guess where the love one another command is sandwiched in between? Immediately before, Jesus is betrayed. And immediately after, Jesus foretells Peter's denial. That he that goes out in the opening line that I just read, that he is Judas, who leaves after eating bread with the group to gather soldiers and temple police to go out and arrest Jesus in the garden. And immediately after, the very next exchange is all about Peter's denial, which as we know happens three times before the cock crows. So do you see? The command to love is expressed in the midst of expressions of denial and betrayal by members of Jesus' inner circle, no less. So maybe we shouldn't breeze by this comment too quickly, relegate it to the realm of, of appliques on pillows and cute little wall plaques. Because today's context reminds us that being agents of the radical, eternal, unconditional love that Jesus offers the world isn't something that we do that comes naturally. It's more than a feeling, more than something we do only when we find the object of our affection to be agreeable or alluring or, or agrees with us. That's why it's called a command. In fact, liking someone is not a prerequisite to loving them in the manner of Jesus. Loving one another is a disposition that transcends our emotions. It's a decision, day by day by day, to seek the highest good for the other. It means understanding one's neighbor, whether across the hall or across the world, as precious, a child of God. No wonder this reading from John is paired up with Peter's vision of the profane animals that are declared clean for him to eat. Because Peter discovers that love one another means extending beyond the Jewish community with the gospel message and throughout the ancient world. It's hard to even overestimate what a mind-bending concept this was. Between actually having the dream, meeting up with Cornelius, retelling the dream, noting its impact, this episode spans two large chapters in Acts. To borrow a saying we've been hearing recently, this thing is huge. Now at this point, I could tell you a heartwarming story about love. Somebody that stepped out of a comfort zone, removed blinders, and honored a fellow child of God, and that would be nice. Nothing wrong with that. Heartwarming. But I don't want to only be heartwarming. I want to be heart-moving. I want to be heart-changing. Because my prayer is that your joining in worship on Sunday has everything to do with your Monday and your Tuesday and your Wednesday and beyond. To love one another wherever life takes us. In our jobs, doing errands, watching a ball game, having lunch, negotiating with a customer, interacting with my family, talking to a colleague, having an encounter with someone with whom you have nothing in common with, maybe has even things about them that displease you. Of course, we won't always get it right. We're not Jesus. We're not perfect. But we can, and sometimes we do, choose love. And we know how good it feels. So what I invite you to do right now is provide your own sermon illustration, tailor-made just for you. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to look at snapshots of your own life this week and be specific. 
First, when over the past week did you choose love? When did you set your needs aside for another? What were the circumstances? Who are the people? When did you love first and form opinions second? When did you help someone without first figuring out if you had time or resources or even interest? Give thanks for it. Celebrate it. Believe that the Holy Spirit blew fresh wind within you. But now, think about a situation this week in which loving was hard. When you couldn't escape your judgment first, your intolerance first, or your impatience, all of which got in the way of love and hardened your heart a bit, erected a barrier. Pray about that too. Pray that love would invade your heart and call upon the Lord to show you a way forward. Seek to be an instrument of reconciling love, even if you're in the midst of a disagreement. Love one another as I have loved you it's so simple, so obvious, so obviously difficult. It is the perfect love of God that claims us in baptism, and so we live secure in that love. Thanks be to God. So little children, Jesus says, choose it, share it. In the midst of our broken lives, which are prone to betrayal and denial, narrowness and judgment, seek to rise above it and make the first move. And so I close with a beautiful prayer attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you.